Hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to tell you a story about making connections. In my little room in Cambridge, I have four posters on my walls. One is a painting by Picasso, while the other three are pages from Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks. Two of these pages contain anatomical drawings he probably made during his time in Milan where, when he performed multiple dissections on human bodies. But today I'm going to talk to you about the third page, which contains the drawing you've, you've all probably seen before, Vitruvian Man. This drawing depicts a man with his feet firmly on the ground and arms widely spread, perfectly framed in a square. It also shows a man in a spread eagle position that can be inscribed in a circle. The name of this drawing comes from the Roman architect Vitruvius, who wrote the book called De Architectura, which, which, is the, which is the Latin translation for On Architecture. In this book, Vitruvius describes how the proportions of the human body relate to the macrocosmos, and he argues that these proportions should be the standard unit of measure in architecture. So here we have Leonardo producing this drawing based on a few paragraphs from this book. But before we go on, I need to tell you something about one of Leonardo's lifelong obsessions, squaring the circle. This is an ancient problem, literally. The problem goes as follows. Given a straight edge and a compass, produce, produce a square with the same area as a given circle using a finite number of steps. Leonardo was obsessed with it. You could see many, many pages from his notebooks with attempts of solving this. Of course, he did not know something. In 1882, a mathematician named von Lindemann showed that the task is basically impossible. Since pi is a transcendental number, you would actually need an infinite number of steps. Of course, Leonardo did not know that. So now that you know this context, you might understand why one day, while I was staring at this poster in my room, I actually started to wonder whether the circle and the square in this drawing have actually the same area or not. I was really, really curious and excited about this possibility. It could have been like one of Leonardo's hidden gems right in front of me. So I did the calculations, I started to measure, and soon I was disappointed. They were different. Uh, so how, how come they were different? The numbers were not as close as I would have expected them to be. But I did not stop there. Uh, there was, of course, a possibility that my calculations were plain wrong, or maybe the drawing I had had completely different proportions from the original. So, you know, I did what uh, each of us would do, I just googled it. And I was shocked again. So, why I was shocked? The, the only serious attempt to answer this question was in a book written in 1998 by two authors. Uh, one is Klaus Schroer, who's a mathematical artist, and he wrote this book with uh, Klaus Ari, who was uh, an art historian. For your reference, uh, Vitruvian Man dates back to 1492, so basically it took humanity more than 500 years to produce a serious mathematical analysis. I was shocked. The authors in the book confirmed that the areas were not the same, but they proposed something very, very interesting. They claim that Leonardo has hidden an algorithm for squaring the circle in this drawing. So I hope you're in the mood for doing some geometry. This might be the biggest proof I've ever done. So this is the square and the circle uh, from the drawing. Now, you see that point near the vertical axis? That's where the point where the arm of the Vitruvian man actually starts, so it's about here. Now imagine the man in the drawing would rotate their arm like that. That would describe a semicircle, which would look like this. Now, look at the point where this semicircle intersects the square. That's going to be in the top right corner. So if we unite that point with this point over here, and then we are going to draw this perpendicular line, which goes through that point over there, where the circle intersects the square, we get the second point in the middle. This second point will be the center of a new circle. So this circle will, will, be, will have a radius equal to the distance from that second point to the second point from the top right corner. So let's see this second circle. It looks like this. It's a slightly bigger circle. Now, if we also draw this line going from that point over there, going through the center of the new circle, 
we get a new point there where, th where it intersects this bigger circle. Now, the distance from that point to the bottom is going to give us the length of a new square. So we get a bigger circle and a bigger square. So yeah, I know what you're thinking. Very fancy. What's the deal with this? So the deal is this, this new circle and this new square are actually much closer in terms of areas. They are not identical, but much, much closer. So I know I promised you something which is going to be identical, so we are not quite there yet. The interesting thing is that if you repeat this algorithm an infinite number of times, uh, it's going to take you a while. Uh, but in the limit, this square and this circle will have identical areas. So we will produce bigger and bigger circles and squares, and they're going to be almost identical. So I believe that it is unlikely that Leonardo actually knew about this, as the authors claim in the book. I believe he would have shared this with his friend, mathematician, Luca Pacioli, and probably we would have had some more clear evidence of its existence. But I don't think it's so important whether Leonardo knew it or not. The most important thing is that this algorithm would be almost impossible to produce without Vitruvian men. It shows a nice interplay between mathematics and art. And let's not forget, it all started with a Roman architect 2,000 years ago. So how come no one noticed this algorithm for 500 years? What happened there? I think Schroer's profession is the first clue. How many mathematical artists have you heard of? And then there's the second author, who's, who's an art historian. There's a nice interplay between multiple fields. This book they produced in 1998 is at the intersection of multiple fields. And that it's sort of contrary how society seems to work or the direction the society seems to go nowadays, where you are basically encouraged to focus on your own field, do your own job very good, and not care about anything else, because you don't have time to look in other fields. The education system is also built in such a way to encourage people to specialize. So you have in school these fields, and you need to master them. You need to master a field and focus on it, and that's going to be your profession. But the thing is, fields are just illusions. In nature, you're never going to see fields. You don't, you're not going to see the separation we are always using. In nature, you're not going to see anywhere else something like, this is physics, then here's a wall, then here's biology. There's nothing like that. But it's the way we think about it. So I think these are bounding boxes, which just limit the scope of our, scope of our thinking and day-to-day -day discussions. And it's not surprising it's actually like that because our brains are also like that. This categorical thinking is deeply embedded in our brains. And I want to give you an example, colors. You can imagine them as a continuous spectrum going from blue to red. However, we can name just a few colors, maybe 10, maybe 11 or so. So that means we're actually not using a lot, actually an infinite part of that spectrum. We are not just using it a lot. We just take a segment from there, we call it red, we take another bar, we call it yellow, and so on. Neuroscientists and linguists have actually looked at this, and they show that people actually remember better colors which are closer to the visual meaning of a color name. So, for example, if a certain color is closer to what I'm imagining when I'm saying red, I'm more likely to remember it. Computer scientists have also understood this, and they came up with pre-processing algorithms which map all the colors in an image to one of these buckets. So why do we do this? What's the reason behind this? Is it just the flaw of the human brain? It's actually not. It's actually a feature. Um, and that's because uh, the human brain has limited memory and limited computational power. So it's actually a very good design choice. It allows it to process all the information it is bombarded with effectively and to store it efficiently. But I think it could also harm progress. So I come from the field of artificial intelligence, and it's a very multidisciplinary field, and it's one of the reasons I enjoy it so, so much. And I want to give you an example of that with some recent research that I've done, and, I'm st and it's still ongoing. Teaching robots how to walk. So walking is difficult, trust me. Um, I know you've all walked in here, but it is difficult. You might have forgotten, but it actually took you a couple of months to learn how to walk. And you did that via a process called reinforcement learning. So what's that? Um, you just take actions by trial and error while also receiving feedback from the environment. So for instance, you 
might make a few steps and fall over, uh, and then you get negative feedback in the form of pain, or maybe you actually manage to, to walk for a little longer and you grab your favorite toy and your brain is gonna generate some dopamine, you're happy, and over time the brain actually learns to associate rewards with actions, and slowly you learn how to walk. And the fundamental principles of what I've just described govern in most of the state-of-the-art algorithm for teaching robots how to do all sorts of things, including walking. But then, I started to wonder about something interesting. There are examples in nature which don't work quite like that. For instance, in some species, some animals are able to walk right away after birth. There's no learning there. It looks like evolution is able to find direct solutions. So I started to wonder whether combining evolution and learning could bring any benefits in these algorithms. And it turns out they can. In my research, I've shown that combining the two together could outperform either alone by a lot. And again, behind this research, there, there are many concepts coming from neuroscience, biology, mathematics, genetics, behavior, biology. Crossing borders between fields can drive progress. Benoit Mandelbro, uh, a mathematician, the pioneer of fractals and one of the pioneers of chaos theory, used to call himself a nomad by choice because his work involved moving a lot between the well-established disciplines. I believe the world needs more nomads by choice, more da Vinci's curious enough to leave the comfort of their own narrow fields. It's time to travel between fields and make connections. Thank you.